Well, welcome back to our daily Bible study on the spiritual realm. In lesson two, and as we get started on lesson two, I want to remind you of our theme verse. It's in Ephesians chapter six, verse twelve, which says, "For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness." against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's, uh, that statement is why I believe this is worth our time and um, study. It was. If not... Okay, now, if that kind is true, um, show of hands, who believes this first is true? Okay. If it is, then uh, I think we probably ought to know something about what we're up against. So that's, that's why we're devoting time to this this evening. And um, young people, I wanted to give you a special word about that. I know there was some um, distraction last week. And the, the reason why this matters to you, if you're, if you're a young person, you should be listening to me right now. Young men especially. If, if this is true, or should I say, since this is true, you've got two choices. Two paths in life. You are either going to be a dragon slayer or you're going to be lunch. That, that's about the long and the short of your choices. So I want you to grow up to slay dragons, not to grow up to get eaten by them. So here's what we talked about last week. We talked about the uh, creation and power of these beings, these heavenly beings that we broadly refer to as uh, angels and demons, although we thought it was a little, more, a little more complicated than that. And this week we're going to discuss their occupation, what they do, what they have done and, and do, and then we'll also talk about their destination. And um, I intend to get through that tonight. Um, there's a lot of material to cover, so um, we'll see if we don't, if we don't, if we don't. I'd like to give you a little bit of a answer questions uh, if possible. But I'd really like to spend our final two weeks on how we engage in this battle, if at all possible. So we'll, we'll get through as much as we can of those two points. When, uh, when, when discussing their um, occupation, we were introduced to the concept last week of this divine council. The fact that God created humankind to be his representatives and administrators on earth, but even prior to that, he had created other, the Bible uses the word Elohim, uh, to be his representatives and administrators in the heavenly realm. Both families, as we discussed, if we could use that language, were created to image God in their respective realms. But, um, when we think about their occupation, what they have done, just as there was rebellion on earth in the garden uh, of mankind, so also there was a rebellion in the heavenly realm. So we'll talk about some, some key historical events in that regard. Now, I say events, and you say, what events? There was one rebellion, right? The, the devil rebelled, Satan rebelled, and he led a third of the angels with him. Anybody heard that before? Yeah, we all have. Um, and we, we commonly heard the description of the rebellion that uh, when Ezekiel is addressing the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, and when Isaiah addresses the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, they both seem to refer to something that almost harkens back to maybe we're describing actually um, looking past that human ruler and looking back to the original rebel. But where do we get the idea that Satan rebelled and took a third of the angels with him. Anybody know? 
We got that idea from Revelation chapter 12. And in verse 3, John describes another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, do we know that this dragon that John is talking about is Satan? We do, because a few verses later, he says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So yes, it's about Satan. Do we know that it's about his original rebellion? My answer is no. I don't know that for sure. Not from the context of Revelation 12. This, the, the context is either the Advent or perhaps more specifically, the, not the first Advent, but the, the second Advent or right before the Great Tribulation. So I'm not sure if that verse is actually talking about an original rebellion with the devil and one third of the angels. What I do know is that, in fact, the Bible speaks of more than one angelic rebellion. And so we'll, we'll consider those. Now, regardless of whether Revelation 12 is specifically talking about um, Satan's original rebellion in heaven, we do know that Satan did rebel sometime in the beginning. And how do we know that? Well, two primary ways. One, John says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for The devil has been sinning from... The beginning. And I presume when John says from the beginning, he means from our beginning, like Genesis 1-1. So uh, when we meet the devil in Genesis chapter 3, as the serpent in the garden, he's already rebelled. And that was... Uh, Jesus, of course, said something like this. He said that, that Satan had been a murderer from the beginning, using that same kind of language. So, yes, in those... Um, from verses like that, we know that Satan rebelled uh, early on. But secondly, we know he rebelled because he tempted our parents as a garden. In the Garden of Eden, there was a, uh, an attempted um, takeover, hostile takeover on earth of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and that was Satan doing that. We know that he had rebelled against God because he was trying to lead our first parents astray, trying and succeeding. So when did that rebellion occur? I'm not exactly sure. The, the Bible doesn't explicitly say. It does seem to link that to the creation of man. Um, so we might speculate that that had something to do with his rebellion. But at any rate, he, uh, when he appears for the first time in Scripture, he appears as a rebel and as a deceiver. Now, <clears throat> who is Eve talking to in the garden? A serpent, right? That's what the text says. Um, does, does Eve think that she's just talking to one of the animals? And unsurprised, for some reason, to see this animal speaking. Well, the, the New Testament would indicate that um, she knew better. And of course, Eden um, was more than a garden. Eden was... Yes, the garden in which God placed the man and the woman after he created them. But it's also apparently a, a meeting place. It's certainly, you know, where God met with man. But it looks like it was also the place where God had those divine council meetings after the earth was created. So I infer from that that other council members would have been in the garden and that Eve probably would have seen them before and wasn't surprised to have one of them speaking with her. Now, why do I think that the garden was the council meeting place? Well, mostly I think that because of Ezekiel. When Ezekiel is describing um, that taunt that seems to slip past that human leader and speak of the original rebel, he says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God, in the midst of the stones of fire. You walked. This is, again, a, a taunt addressed to the king of Tyre, but looks to be looking past the king of Tyre, because I don't think the king of Tyre was in even the garden of God, and I don't think he was an anointed guardian of cherubim. And that language that Ezekiel uses, that language of 
garden and mountain and assembly and in the midst of the stone of fire, that, that seems to be indicating the place where God met with man and also where other meetings were taking place. So I speculate from that that Eve had probably seen this being before, the being that we meet in the, serp in the garden as the serpent, and no doubt knew that he was one of the Elohim, the sons of God, that predated her. And so he lies to her, and she fell for his lies. And Adam, who was with her, wasn't deceived, but went along in this rebellion anyway. And God had said, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, and they ate of it. And so the end of the human race came. Except, not yet. It didn't, because it looked like the devil won, right? And when you read Genesis 3, that looks like a, a smashing success for the serpent in leading that rebellion. He succeeded in getting the man who was to be God's vice-regent over this earth to rebel against God and eat the forbidden fruit and rebel, therefore. And so, this if, if I'm the serpent and I watch... Adam take that bite, I think my thinking is, okay, now God has to kill him, and so the earth is no longer going to belong to men, but to me. But as you know, the story doesn't end there. It, it begins there, because God's not done. And if you remember that in the midst of the curse that God pronounces on the serpent, he gives a clue as to how it is that God is going to restore this now rebellious human race. In chapter 3 and verse 15, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, yes, the man and the woman are absolutely going to die and every descendant of theirs is absolutely going to die, but there's the key word, descendant. So through childbirth, the human race doesn't end with Adam and Eve, it will continue. It only continues through the bearing of children, but it will continue. And God predicts, however uh, obliquely, without spelling out the mechanism here, that the serpent's head would ultimately be crushed, and that that would happen through the seed of the woman. Interesting. Interesting turn of phrase. Now you notice, it's through childbearing that all of this happens, right? It's through, through childbearing that the human race is going to continue to exist and not cease to exist when the progenitors of the race die. And it's through childbearing, specifically through the woman giving birth, that the serpent is going to be ultimately crushed. That gives me a clue as to why it is that Satan seems to war so hard against childbearing. I kind of noticed that yeah. in this in this world, the, the the more wealth increases in a nation, the more childbirth rates go down, and not to mention uh, practices in uh, evil demonic religions throughout history of child sacrifice and of course. Our, in our own day, abortion, our version of child sacrifice, and not to mention the proliferation of something like homosexuality or certainly transgenderism. If you wanted to make sure that your children were born, that'd be a good way to accomplish it. So the, the main issue here is that the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent, and that, when, when after God says that, immediately the scripture begins basically a hunt for the seed. We saw that in Genesis, and, and it continues through the, the calling of Abraham and through ultimately to the birth of Christ. So th there was that rebellion. Satan rebelled and then induced our uh, human parents to rebel. But that was not the only rebellion, angelic rebellion, that's recorded in the scripture. The next one is right before the flood. It's mentioned right before the flood. So you remember in as Moses gives his account of the creation and um, the fall and the first murder and 
and so forth, and then the population <coughs> grows, and people are living a, a long time, and then all of a sudden we come to chapter 6, we begin the flood narrative in chapters 6 and 7 and 8 and ending in 9. So in, in the Bible, Genesis 6 is where the flood narrative begins. And it's very interesting how the flood narrative begins. Do you remember? In chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, this is how Moses introduces the issue of the flood. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Now, at this point in Scripture, if I'm reading in Genesis, I know sons of God, that means angels. And daughters of man, I can pretty well figure out what that means. That means, you know, human, females. And so, the, my first blush at reading this verse, it looks like angels marrying human women. The text goes on. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for his flesh, his day shall be 120 years. And I take that to mean God is pronouncing that in 120 years he's going to end uh, mankind. 120 years for man to remain on the earth. And then the next verse says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Now, you're, you're paying attention to what Moses is doing, and you, you're coming to the flood narrative, and he begins in chapter 6 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men took wives from them. And then here in verse 4, he mentions the Nephilim. We haven't, we haven't met them before in Scripture, but of course... Uh, Moses' audience knew exactly who they were. And for some reason, they're mentioned here, introduced here, and they're connected in some way to this angelic rebellion. And that word Nephilim, as you might guess, that's not an English word. It's just a transliteration, uh, not a translation. And the word, it's, it's confusing um, where it comes from. That's why it remains untranslated most of the time. But I can tell you how the... Greek translation of the Old Testament that was in use in Jesus' day translated it. They translated it with the word giants. Giants. Uh, the Nephilim giants. So, knowing these things, this, I would, I would, at my first pass of reading this, I would say, okay, this looks like Moses is telling me that angels came to earth, took human wives, had giants by them. Like, that's the connection, which is a, a bizarre thing to think. And I'll tell you, I, I mentioned when, when we covered this passage in Genesis, this, this is difficult for me to accept that reading, and I don't want to buy it. In fact, I immediately think of what Jesus did. Jesus said, speaking of our resurrection, that for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. There you go, right? Angels in heaven don't Mary aren't given in marriage, and we infer, a lot of people infer from that, that you know, they can't reproduce uh, sexually, and, and so th that should end the discussion, right? Well, he doesn't say they do not. He says, he says they, they do not, he doesn't say they cannot. The normal course of the way things work with angels is that they do not marry nor are given in marriage, but my plain reading of Genesis 6 would indicate to me that these angels, these sons of God, defied that normal creation order and took human wives. Now, here's the thing. If that's all I had, I had a, a kind of a difficult uh, passage in Genesis 6 to parse, and I had to reconcile that with what, the rest of what I knew about angels and all, I, I, I would be very reluctant to uh, accept this, this reading. However, that's not the only thing that argues for this understanding. Peter says in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, he's talking about false teachers, and he says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell... 
and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, what, what angels sinning is he talking about there? What angels are bound until judgment? He goes on, If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, now he's just tied the issue of angels rebelling to the flood of Noah. And then he says, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Remember, this is one sentence in Peter's thinking. He's tied the sin of angels to the flood of Noah and to sexual immorality, as exemplified by Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, that sounds like what my reading of Genesis chapter 6 suggested that I didn't want to accept. And he's not the only one to do this. Jude, in his short little epistle, somehow manages to squeeze in also talking about false teachers, he says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now that sounds a lot like what Peter said, doesn't it? And when he says, did not stay within their own position of authority, that sounds like a defiance of the creation order. And when he says they're kept in eternal chains until judgment, that's clearly incarceration. In other words, this isn't Satan we're talking about. He's not kept in chains. Now, he will be for a time before he's thrown into the lake of fire, but he's not now. So what, these angels uh, are incarcerated, kept in chains, just like Peter said. But Jude goes on, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now, what word jumps out at you in that verse? This is a continuation of what we just read. So, the angels who did not stay within their positions of authority kept in chains, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality. <coughs> Why tie angels sitting to Sodom and Gomorrah? He explicitly spells out why. It has to do with sexual morality. Okay, so here's where I am. Some angels sin. I got that. That one's pretty clear. That sin appears to be sexual in nature. It was hinted at in the taking of wives in Genesis. It was made more explicit by Peter and very explicit by Jude. The rebel angels were incarcerated. They're not presently loose. They're in, held in chains until judgment. That rebellion is somehow tied to the flood event because that's what, what you know, uh, Moses begins the flood narrative with. And there's some connection of this rebellion to giants, somehow or other. The, the Nephilim, they got thrown in there in the mix in um, Genesis 6 as well. And, while Moses just mentions it, and Jude and Peter refer to it, Jude and Peter, when they refer to it, are actually not referring to it originally. They're quoting. They're quoting another author. Jude says in... 14th verse, so skip down 7 verses from where we were. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. He, he's quoting uh, Enoch. He says, To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way of all the harsh things that ungodly sins have spoken against them. Now, you you, uh, you you understand that Jude is quoting Enoch, who seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, You know that Enoch is mentioned in Genesis, and he in fact was the seventh from Adam. You remember him because he stood out in the genealogy because why? He's the one who was not because God took him. Apparently Enoch didn't die, but was transferred to heaven. Now, I remember that 
brief introduction to Enoch in Genesis. I don't remember this quotation in Genesis. Do you? It's not there. That's not where Jude is quoted from. He's quoting it from a, a book called First Enoch. We call it First Enoch. Who knows what it was originally called? And First Enoch is part of what we call the Pseudepigrapha. We call them that because, um, generally speaking, they're letters that bear an author's name but weren't actually written by that person. And Jude quotes this particular uh, letter that we know as First Enoch quite a bit throughout his letter, including in the issue of the angels who sinned. And the book we know as First Enoch has a lot to say about this Genesis 6 rebellion. Now, I'm throwing up my speculation uh, warning, because is First Enoch written by the biblical person we know as Enoch? Maybe, I mean, it's possible that it was preserved. Uh, probably not. Is it scripture? No, it's not scripture. Uh, the Jews didn't consider it to be part of their scriptures, although they held it in very high esteem. The early church didn't. There, there was a little bit of debate, but mostly nobody has ever considered First Enoch scripture, even though they considered it really important and, in many cases, um, authoritative and useful. So, it's not scripture. Does that mean it's not true? Or at least parts of it are, could be true. Of course they could be. You're not... Um, the, the idea of a scriptural author within scripture quoting a non-scriptural author, that's not a foreign idea. You see that happen other places, right? Uh, it happens a number of times in the Old Testament. You can think even of um, Paul quoting... Uh, non-Christian authors of his day, quoting them approvingly. So, that's very possible. And so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what First Enoch says about this Genesis 6 rebellion. Not all the details, but just a little. And I'm going to tell you about it for the following reasons, okay? Even though I don't believe that First Enoch is uh, part of your Bible, it should be included in you are welcome to read it, but you shouldn't treat it the same way you treat Jude or Peter or any of the other 64 books of the Bible. But th there are three reasons why I'm going to tell you what Enoch said about this particular rebellion. Number one, it was the common understanding of all the Jews of the intertestamental, intertestamental period, all of the Jews of Jesus' day. Um, this, this is what everybody understood who happened. The, the commonly accepted version of history. Um, Peter and Jude, of course, throw a real monkey wrench to me. Uh, when they quote it, especially Jude does, as extensively as Jude does, and as approvingly as both of them do, that lends a lot of credibility to what, at least what First Enoch says about this. It doesn't mean that First Enoch as a book is right about everything, but it does indicate that when he's talking about this, it's probably right. The other reason is, the third reason is that this, this understanding of that Genesis 6 rebellion was the common understanding, not just of Jews in the intertestamental period um, and the first century, and not just of, um, the, more particularly, it was the view of, as far as we can tell, the early church. Early Church Fathers refer to this book and this event in particular, refer to the event in the understanding that First Enoch presents of it. And in fact, the early church basically believed this version of events until Augustine, the fourth century. Yes? Uh, do we have an origin date for First Enoch? I don't know when First Enoch was written. I know it's old. Uh, you, you, besides having Besides having first century authors quote it, you also find it in the Dead Sea Scrolls and that kind of thing. So it, it was probably hundreds of years before Christ. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so here's a, here's the nutshell version of this of the details that Enoch fills in, or, or whoever wrote first Enoch fills in for us about this. He, as I said, he gives a lot more detail about the specific rebellion that you see alluded to in Genesis 6 and in uh, 2 Peter and in Jude and so forth. 
And he records the sin of, he, he uses the word watchers. The watchers. He, that's how he refers to not sons of God or whatever. Now, that, that language you don't see it in Scripture except Daniel. Daniel uses that word a few times to refer to um, angels. Um, so it's not totally foreign, but it's not one that we use a lot. But Enoch uses that a lot. The Watchers. And what, what the account that he gives of the rebellion of the Watchers is that basically about 200 of them see the beautiful human women make a pact amongst themselves. Look, I'm not going down there and taking one by myself because I'll get zapped. You all got to go with me. And so they make a pact and they descend, and the, the, the place that Enoch records their descent is the place in the picture, Mount Hermon. Um, this would be like Gaza Strip, Syria area. And um, they descend on Mount Hermon, they take human wives, and they father by these women offspring, who are, of course, hybrids, because they have angel dads and human moms. And these offspring also are giants. And they wind up uh, being bad news for humanity. And uh, more on that in a minute. And then the other thing that the Watchers do in Enoch's retelling is they, they come to Earth, they, be, they take these wives, they beget these offspring, and they teach mankind knowledge that we were not supposed to have. Knowledge that angels had that wasn't given to us by God. They teach us things like basically astrology, um, some, think of it as sorcery, things about roots and spells and that kind of thing. And they teach us, uh, we could just say technology, but more specifically about, mostly about weapons. And of course, they also have these offspring who are giants. And the story about the giants is they wind up ruling over men, obviously, because they're bigger and more powerful and uh, would be no doubt, no doubt, no doubt above us uh, on the food chain, so to speak. And speaking of on the food chain, they ate a lot, ate us out of house and home, and eventually started consuming humans. And the, the earth cries out to God, the story goes according to Enoch, and there are archangels who are sent by God to... to corral these watchers and imprison them in under the earth to await their final judgment. Now, a little far-fetched, I would say. What did you say, Enoch's story? Um, however, I mean, are there giants in the Bible? Yeah. Well, you know of one, right? Yeah. <laughs> a guy named Goliath of Gath. Yeah. Everybody knows of that giant. But you also probably know he's not the only one. He's, yeah, you can think of another guy named Og, King of Bashan, but you also remember before that even, you remember the report of the spies. The spies come back and they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they'd spied out. Not about the land itself, they said, the land through which we've gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And they go on in the next verse, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. What's that sound? <coughs> giants. And uh, giants actually feature fairly prominently in the conquest of Canaan in that narrative, especially with, with Joshua in particular. And they're not really eradicated, apparently, until David, it looks like, is the one to finally get rid of the last of them. And Enoch tells us one more wild thing that I'm going to tell you. That I, this is this is I only have Enoch to go on plus you know church fathers and, and so forth. I don't have I don't have any verses to go on this. One. But Enoch's account is that these giants, the offspring of the Watchers and the human women, because their spirits were both of earth and heaven, when you kill them, their spirits were consigned to basically the air here. And those spirits of the dead Nephilim are what we know in the New Testament accounts as demons. So when you encounter a demon possessing a human being in the New Testament, 
Enoch would tell you that's because that's the spirit of the departed Nephilim who is condemned to dwell here and would like to have a body. So, <laughs> I, I the, were there giants in the Bible? Yes. yes. Are there demons yes. in the New Testament today? Absolutely there are, no question. Are demons the spirits of dead giants? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay? I know that there were angels who rebelled. And I know that some of the angels who rebelled are currently incarcerated, but not all of them, including the leader of the band, Satan. And I know Enoch gives all of this detail that Moses didn't bother to give, although Moses seems to be kind of leading that way, given his um, context. I know that the detail that Enoch gives is, as I said, the, the commonly relied on in, in, by Jews of, of Jesus' day, and Peter and Jude quote him pretty approvingly. It's not just pretty approvingly, they quote him authoritatively, as if he knew what he was talking about on the subject, even though they don't get into that. So, that's what I know for sure and what I don't know for <coughs> sure about. That second rebellion. That was a doozy, wasn't it? <laughs> now, if you'd like to speculate about giants and what all happened to them and whether they're still around and how they wound up on the earth still after the flood wiped them out, you would have thought, I'd be glad to do that on our own time sometime. Will there be any more angelic rebellions? We know of one with the, the original rebel. We know of this one that's quoted, that's referred to in Genesis 6, that's referred to also in the New Testament. Will there be any more of them? And we look for other terrible events like this to happen. And my one word answer is no. And I, I have three reasons for that answer. My first reason is I've read the book of Revelation. Have you read it? Are there angels rebelling anew in Revelation? No. you got lots of war going on between angels uh, and angels and, and the population of the earth, but all of the ones fighting against the Lord and his people are already rebels, and all the ones fighting against them and on God's side are already loyal. There are no new rebellions in, them, in there. But there are a couple of other reasons, and, and they revolve around how the New Testament talks about the angels who didn't rebel. Um, you may have missed this little word when we covered it very recently in Mark's Gospel, but back in chapter 8 and verse 38, Jesus said, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the, what? Holy angels. And that's a common way for the New Testament to refer to angels. He doesn't say the innocent angels. He doesn't say the unfallen angels. He doesn't say the angels who haven't rebelled yet. At least he says holy angels. He, he refers to them that way. You see that same phrase, for example, in Revelation 14. There's another expression that's only occurs one time, but I think it's even more enlightening on this, and that is when Paul gives Timothy this charge in 1 Timothy 5, the end of his first letter to Timothy. He says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you. And that, that word elect, you probably know, means chosen, selected uh, by God. And I, I think Paul's language is informative about the fact that there, the, the angels who have not fallen will not be fallen because they are in fact holy and elect angels chosen, chosen by God. So no, no more angel rebellions. Thank goodness the ones we know about were plenty. Alright, so that's enough about their rebellions in the past. What do they do besides rebel or obey? Um, and we'll talk about this in, in three areas. Um, in, what do they do in the Old Testament? What's their occupation in the Gospels as we encounter them there? And what about today? And I'm going to base 
I'm going to base what they're doing today on the New Testament epistles. So past the Gospels, what do we, what do we find out about angels there? So, in the Old Testament, and we'll continue to just use this handy um, division, so now I'll call them holy angels and fallen angels. So, holy angels, what do they do in the Old Testament? Well, in a nutshell, they bring messages and they destroy them. Right? The, the, the classic example of this one would be the visits to Sodom, where both things happen. They, they bring a message and then they destroy the place. That's the classic example. Um, in the Old Testament, you on the on the uh, fallen side, there's hardly any mention of like the word that we commonly see in the New Testament, demons. You do see some of those weird words like I put up on the screen last week, all kinds of mentions of that kind of thing, especially haunting wilderness places. So that's one thing they do. They haunt wilderness places and they solicit and receive worship from human beings a lot. So you don't see that word demons uh, in the Old Testament regularly. There are lots of weird words. You don't, you don't see that umbrella term. You know what you see a lot instead? Gods. You see that language, that language that um, we introduced last week about why the Old Testament would use it that way. You see gods and you see idols. And that really starts in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. For example, in Exodus 12, and verse 12, God explicitly says, I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. Now, Egypt had lots of gods, and Yahweh decisively defeats them all, and embarrassingly uh, defeats them all through the, the various um, plagues that struck Egypt. And of course, the land of Canaan, that the children of Israel who, who got that record are going into, they got lots of gods, and Yahweh doesn't have any more problem with them than he does with uh, the gods of Egypt. And he defeats them, and he spends a lot of time warning Israel not to what? Worship them. Right? Over and over again, God is warning Egypt not to worship the gods of the nations of, in the land that they're going into to drive them out. But in all that um, warning, there's an interesting tension. And you, I, might, I might describe the tension this way. Okay, he warns them, like in the first commandment, right? He warns them not to worship any other gods. But, are those gods real? I'm thinking of Elijah mocking the prophets of Baal. You remember that scene? I love that, that is a fantastic story. That is, that is some first-rate literature. And even better because it's true. Yeah. And Elijah is mocking the prophets of Baal, and he's telling them, you know, yell louder. Maybe your God is on a journey. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe he's on the john. <laughs> and in other words, his message is basically, there's no God listening to you. Yell all you want. Help ain't coming. He seems to have the, the mindset that you see, for example, in, there are so many places we could pull this from, but in Deuteronomy 32, God says of the children of Israel and their idolatry, they have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. Okay, so that the, the Old Testament raises a really important question, I think. Are idols real? Is an idol real? Well, the answer is no, and kind of yes. Okay, here's what I mean. Deuteronomy 32, going back there, they sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. These Johnny-come-lately gods, they, when they were busy worrying about the gods of Egypt, they never even heard of these gods in the Canaanite. They certainly weren't afraid of them. And... An idol is nothing. You, you, you see that, for example, 
in the mocking that God does, for example, of an adulterer who <coughs> fells a tree and he cuts it in pieces, and one piece he cooks his supper over, and the other piece he fashions an idol out of, and he bows down to it and worships it. Ha ha. It's, it's a joke. Yeah, it is a joke. It's laughable. But why so much warning not to do it if it's not a real thing? So the thing about an idol is, yes, the idol is nothing. But it's all built on lies. And those lies all have... The, the, the thing behind the idol is not God, obviously. Even if you try to make an idol of God, like the children of Israel did while Moses was lingering up on Sinai, they built a golden calf and said, this is God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. They, they, they tried to make an idol of the real God. It's not the real God. The idol is never Yahweh. And it's never even the God that you think it is. It's not Baal. It's not Ashtoreth. It's not whatever God you think is your nation's patron deity. Behind those things are, well, like Deuteronomy says, demons. Demons. You're, you're, you think you're worshipping Baal. You think you're worshipping Zeus. You're, you're not worshipping that thing. You're worshipping somebody who lied to you in order to subvert worship away from the true God. So, those entities that are behind all the false religions and all of the idolatry, are those things God, compared to God, they're nothing. <coughs> right? Compared to Yahweh, who created the entities that are lying to you and, and tricking you into making an idol and worshipping it, compared to the God who created all of us and them, they're nothing. Compared to you, they're God's. And yes, they're out to deceive you, and we'll see more of that, of course, in the New Testament. And that, that is why idolatry can be mocked like it is, I mean, just mercilessly, especially by God himself in the Old Testament. It is mocked as if it is the most ridiculous, preposterous, laughable, contemptible notion on the planet, which, in fact, it is. And at the same time, can be warned against like it's so deadly serious, like it might cost you your soul and your life. Because both of those things are true. <coughs> Is an idol anything? No. And, yeah. And so, demons are, are not prominent in the New Testament, but warnings about idolatry and false gods very much are. And let me just summarize all of the warnings. Flee idolatry. Okay? If, if you had to take one message about the spiritual realm and angels and demons and all from the Old Testament, I think this would, this would be my candidate for what the main lesson is. Flee idolatry. That means no sacrificing to them of any kind. Certainly not your children's. No worshipping any other god or an idol, even if you think that idol is of the one true god. Don't have anything to do with the worship practices of the nations around them. Don't sacrifice, don't do witchcraft, no spells, no incantations, no drugs or potions to incite, you know, religious happenings. No divination, no fortune telling, no trying to figure out the future by use of any of this stuff. Uh, no cultic prostitution. No involving sex in worship. No Necromancy, no trying to contact the spirits of dead people. All of this completely forbidden over and over again in, in the Old Testament. Flee idolatry. What about in the Gospels? Holy angels and fallen angels, what are their occupations in the Gospels? And think back through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Even, even we can talk about Acts in this context. All right, in the Gospels, holy angels, what are they doing? They are bringing messages, that sounds familiar, and ministering to Christ. That's about what we see them do, right? They, 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 you've got an angel bringing a message to Mary about the birth of the Savior. You've got an angel bringing a message to Zechariah about the birth of the forerunner of the Messiah. You've got angels ministering to Christ at his temptation, Mark didn't spell that part out, but he mentioned it. Matthew gives more information. 
Um, and then angels apparently also ministering to Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest and crucifixion. That's basically what you see holy angels doing in the Gospels. What about the fallen angels? What are they doing in the Gospels? You know what the demons are doing in the Gospels. They're possessing people. Actually, it didn't look like that in any of the accounts in the, in the, in the that we've read so far. What, what do they do when they're possessing people? Well, you've seen a number of these cases in Mark. What are they doing? Are they tempting people to sin? Is that what they're trying to do? Are they like, you know, you need, to, you need to steal from your neighbor. Is that what they're doing when they're possessing people? No, so far what we've seen them do is causing physical ailments to be. Everything from, you know, an issue of blood to the boy who has the seizures and, and is mute and uh, the, the guy who's just stone cold crazy living in the tombs with the legion of demons possessing him. That's the kind of stuff you see them doing. Not tempting people to sin, but harming people causing them physical maladies of every imaginable stripe. Uh, I suspect they would like to kill people and just aren't given permission to do so they hurt them. Um, so in the Gospels, the fallen angels, I would summarize, they possess people and they submit to Christ. Right? This is what we see demons doing in the New Testament. Whether they are the hybrid spirits of dead giants, or whether they're just a, a different, a, a, just a ordinary fallen angel, whatever they actually are, this is what they do. They possess people, and they submit to Christ. They, they, they not happily, as you've noticed, they're not excited about it. They uh, are very reluctant, and yet utterly helpless to do otherwise. Jesus is just plundering the strong man's house throughout the Gospels in, in ordering these, these demons around. The, uh, today, what are they doing in the what are they doing in the New Testament books? And we infer from that still up to today. Um, here's how I'd summarize that one give it more detail. Holy angels in the New Testament, they protect the church and they observe our gatherings. And, um, and individuals in that, that make up the church uh, protect us. Fallen angels, here's how I'd summarize them. They rule, they try to delay Christ's return. Talk more about that. And um, number one on the list, deceive, deceive, that is what they do. They're stock in the trade. Speaking of the, the holy angels and their roles, so the writer of Hebrews says of the holy angels, the elect angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? What, what a beautiful summary of God's role for the angels regarding us. Sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. That, that is how God uh, inspired the writer of the Hebrews to summarize the role of the holy angels, the elect angels. That's how they're described. What do they actually specifically do? What, what's involved in their serving this, for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Here, here's, the, here's the summary New Testament message on that. None of your business. <laughs> I say that because it's not spelled out. We, we, don't, have, um, we don't have details. How do they serve? Do, does each of us have a guardian angel specifically? And do they protect us from car crashes? And, you know, whatever million questions you might have, the Bible doesn't answer. But it does say that this work is serious. For example, there's a warning in Matthew 18. Jesus says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones one of those who believes in me. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Uh, isn't it interesting that Jesus gives a warning of that? What a, what a, it, it, this gives you some indication that whatever the role of these holy angels in serving, it's serious business. It's serious business. And Paul 
says in 1 Corinthians 11, when he's given the instructions about head coverings, women having head coverings, he says, that is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. I, I said one of, the, one of my two bullets on what the angels do now is observe our gatherings, Not, like, like they watch the church, like when we, we come together. Paul said in... But before this verse, in verse 6, he says, For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And then in verse 10, he says this, That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, whatever else that means, which we will not attempt to deal with exegetically, see, whatever else that verse means, it does imply that angels are present when the church is assembled. <clears throat> this is talking about orderliness in worship, the whole chapter is actually really the whole book is. And he says because of the angels, as if the angels are present and we are gathered together. When the church is assembled, they are present and observing. I think Revelation and its mention of the age of churches indicates something similar. So that's about the most we know about angels' roles in the, the holy angels' role in our lives today. What about fallen angels? Well, we saw the big issue in the Old Testament was idolatry, right? That was the major issue. That was the thing that wound up getting the children of Israel yanked out of their land by foreign invaders. Good thing that's over. Uh -huh. right, we don't have to worry about that. Why does John close his first epistle the letter of 1 John. You know, you know what his last words in that epistle are? After all the, I mean, that's a beautiful little epistle. It's really uh, about how you know that you belong to the Lord. And, and he writes this beautiful letter in uh, five glorious chapters. And you remember how he ends the letter? His sign off is, little children, keep yourselves from titles. Isn't that an odd way to end your letter? Like, that's what's on your mind when you sign off your letter to the church? Peter said, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And maybe you read Peter saying that, and you're like, okay, Peter. Maybe in your day, maybe in the first century, that's what Gentiles wanted to do. But back when they had like full-on temples to gods, pagan gods, false deities, they were worshiping all the gods of the Roman pantheon that they inherited from Greece. Yeah, maybe then they wanted to spend their time in all this idolatry. We're, we're, Peter, let me tell you, we are past that today. Our culture is secular now. We don't believe in gods anymore. So we don't worship idols anymore. We don't, we don't do idolatry. Paul told the Colossian church, put to death therefore what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Okay, now, when Paul gives a Gentile vice list here in Colossians, that sounds more like our day, right? Peter's may sound a little far-fetched, especially ending with the uh, lawless idolatry part, but Paul, and this is, this is garden, this is what all my neighbors do, not, not my neighbors who are present tonight, but you know, generally speaking, <laughs> this is the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetous, it's like, it, it's like Paul was on social media when he wrote this and saw what consumed our time. He was watching the same shows we were watching. Yep, this is, this is what we do. That sounds like our culture, especially that covetousness part. Have you noticed that? That, that is our culture's like favorite pastime, coveting. You know what coveting is? 
but wanting more is basically what that word means. Oh, that, that's like, that's more American than mama or apple pie or baseball. Yeah. Wanting more. <laughs> okay, I left out part of this verse. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Whoa. Uh oh. If you're covetous, Paul says that's idolatry. And apparently, we enjoy it just as much as the first century Romans did. If you're covetous, wanting more, what God are you worshiping? You 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 are being idolatrous. You've already seen what idolatry means. And you already know the thing about idolatry is whatever God you think you're worshiping, you're actually being like you're not worshiping that God. So when you're coveting, who do you think you're worshiping? The you think you're worshiping yourself. I mean, that's basically what idolatry, or what covetousness is, is worship of self. And that is pretty much the besetting idolatry of the 21st century American, I would say. Uh, selfism, the God of of self. But here's the thing about idolatry. The New Testament agrees with the Old Testament. Behind whatever idol, whatever God you think you're worshiping, even if that God is yourself, behind that is the power of hell. Behind your idolatry are demons. Let me illustrate how the New Testament talks about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul, do you remember, addresses the issue of meat sacrifice to idols? Remember that discussion? 1 Corinthians 8, that, that, that was an issue for the Corinthians. Church. You had people in the church who were dead set against it, and people who thought it wasn't a problem. And, and you remember, probably you've heard a little bit about the cultural context of that. So meat would be offered to an idol in a, in a ceremony, in a temple, you would present it to the, the idol. Guess what? For some reason, the idol never ate it. I wonder why. Because it's not a real thing. And so the meat, rather than being thrown out, would be sold in, you know, at Kroger. And you, you, you would encounter this meat for sale. And um, some Christians, apparently in Corinth, because of their past association with having been involved in those idolatrous sacrificial ceremonies would not buy that meat and wouldn't eat it and thought, thought that it would be sinning because they, they'd been involved in idolatry, because rank idolatry in that before, so they wouldn't eat it. And Paul told them, therefore as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. He's probably quoting them there, that's why the quote marks are on there, but I think he's quoting them approvingly. And that's what he says in verse 4, and he goes on, For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. That's, that's the summary message when you're talking about meat that had been offered in sacrifice and was now available for sale for you to consume. The idol is nothing. And Christians who have grown past their weakness and their past association and all, recognize that. And, and if I, uh, I I don't have any objection to eating in a restaurant that serves food halal, uh, even though I believe Islam is a false religion. I'm, I'm not, I, their, their God is no threat to me and I would eat food from their store or restaurant. However, that's the message when we're talking about eating food that had been sacrificed to an idol and buying that marketplace or whatever. What about participating in the sacrifice itself? Now Paul tells them a very different message. 
On this issue, Paul's message is strikingly uh, more, more, more striking warning here. What do I imply then, he says in verse 19, that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't, you can't, you can't participate in a pagan ceremony on, on Saturday and then the Lord's Supper on Sunday. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Again, the, the, the very idea of crafting something to hold a God is a contemptible and laughable idea. However, it is also a deadly spiritual trap. Because, as Paul says here, you're not worshiping God. You're not even worshiping whatever God you think you're worshiping. You're actually sacrificing to demons. Now, when, when Paul says that, and you think about sacrifices and, and uh, like were happening in his day, it's easy to see, isn't it easy to see how false religions are worshiping false gods as if there would be demons behind that? that that's I can I can figure that out without too much help, right? Can't you? you? You like when I see this Hindu god, I think, yeah, that's not God. And uh, I, I, that 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 probably came from demons. <laughs> I know God didn't tell anybody to draw that or to come up with that conception of what one of the millions of the gods of Hinduism looks like, Vishnu in this case. But the thing is, the false gods aren't always, or even usually, quite this obvious. But one of the main ways the New Testament reveals to us that Satan controls people today is not just through false teaching with false gods and whole, whole invented false systems of religion, but through false teaching about the true God and His gospel. Of course, speaking of false teachers, he told the church of Corinth, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. But false teaching is a primary way that Satan deceives the world and attempts to deceive us, believers, followers of Jesus Christ. This is why there are like, what, two New Testament epistles that don't address this issue of false teaching? It's everywhere. It's everywhere in the New Testament. Now, does it work? Oh, yeah. Hello! <laughs> the most successful Christian TV broadcast network in history is pretty much all false teachers. If you watch TVN, I'm not sorry that I just offended you. Almost entirely false teachers. On, on that network. And it's not just the network. Go into a, a Christian bookstore. They are everywhere. Of course it works. Of course it works. In fact, you shouldn't be the least bit surprised. As Paul told Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to de deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Of course. Demons try to mislead even God's elect with and through false teaching. To deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. That's how Paul describes those who, who would teach falsehood in the name of God. We're going to talk more about that for sure in later sessions. But for now, uh, one more occupation of fallen angels today. Let me see how much... <coughs> I've 
Right. I can't tell time. I know that we have 15 minutes left. I know that uh, discussion was profitable, it sounded like, last week, and I don't want to rub with that. Um, Yeah, let's just stop right there. We'll, we'll pick up the rest of, of this <laughs> next week, their occupation day, because I want to give you a few minutes. Uh, you don't know what I've been, it might have been terrible, it might, it might not have been interested at all. So uh, let me give you a few minutes to talk at your tables, and then we'll gather together again and, and address any pressing questions that came up at your tables. Okay? Okay. okay.